All right, good morning, everybody. So today I'm going over how I score a film that isn't actually a film, which could be a little weird. So as you remember, in my last video, I mentioned I'm working on a theater show, writing, uh, writing score for it. So I'm gonna talk you through how I kind of get going um, to just get the ball rolling and how to stay really, really organized from the beginning because just like on a film, you have individual cues uh, for scenes and stuff. You might have multiple cues for each scene depending on if the tone changes, if different actors come in. So I'm gonna take you through that. I'm also gonna talk about my template for scoring this one and why I set it up like that. And I'll also run, run down like kind of the unique sample libraries that I put into this one just for this project to create this specific sound. Um, so with that, first step on your Tutorial Tuesday, we need a cue sheet. So what I do is I, I take the script and I read through it scene by scene. So my goal for this first step is to transfer my thoughts, what I have in mind for the scene, onto kind of like a shorthand list on my, my cue sheet. It shows cue number, uh, cue name, the duration, how long each scene is, my spotting notes, kind of like what my intentions are for the scene, for the music side, and then description of events to help remind me if I refer back to this without having to go through the script, I'll refer back to this and kind of read through the description of events to double check. Okay, am I hitting this beat? Is this happening right? They're whatever the characters are doing. They're climbing a mountain. Oh, it's supposed to be adventurous. So let me make sure I write something adventurous. And then in the same scene, it might switch to, oh, somebody fell off the mountain. Um, which obviously write something sad or heroic if whoever fell you didn't like very much. Anyway, so that's the goal for this first part. So what I'll do is I'll go through, I'll set my, I'll set a timer on my phone and I'll just read through act one, scene one. Uh, so this one's actually, this one's a short project. This is a one act show. So it's probably gonna be closer to movie length, probably around 90 minutes. So I'll put my timer on, boom, and then I'll start reading. And then when I get to the end, stop the timer, uh, put it in my cue sheet, the duration. So the first scene is about five minutes, 17 seconds. Then I'll go back through that same scene, go back and then jot down notes of the description of events in my, my shorthand cue sheet list. Scene one, I just, I just have transition into scene one. So the scene one doesn't really have any music. It's kind of breaking the fourth wall a little bit because the character's talking to the audience. So I don't really want to score that. I kind of want to have it just be one-on-one, -on -one, the character with the audience. That's just transition music. So I have penciled in overture just in case I write uh, pre-show music into leading into that first scene. At the end of the first scene, I have real transition music which goes into the second scene. So what I have for there, because it's going into scene two, in my cue sheet, I have it written uh, as the first cue of scene two. So I have transition music, and then this is kind of where it gets fun. I'll go back and write in my, my own cue names for this one. So for this one, it's titled To the Camp, um, and it's kind of like, I need it to be a montage sort of sound, because the character is traveling uh, quite a distance. So I need it to sound like we've started in one place and then we end up in a completely different place. That's all stuff that would go in my spotting notes. So I have here, I, I wrote down montage sort of sound evoking traveling long distances, which it should start off very strong and bold and then slowly wind down to lead into the second scene. So you wanna, it's important to see where you're coming from and then where you're going and then kind of bridge the gap with the transition music. Uh, so that's all in my spotting notes. So then I'll keep going. I'll read through scene two, start a new timer so I can time out scene two. After I'm done reading that, I'll go back into throughout scene two, jot down my description of events, kind of what happens, the big key moments. Theater's kind of weird. So you have the scene where you're scoring kind of like a film because you want to, uh, you know, score the scene and highlight whatever the characters are doing and kind of what they're going through in their mindset. You also have to think of the technical side of, okay, well, this scene could be shorter today, but longer tomorrow based on how the actors act. So then in that case, you need to think both like a film and a video game where the characters can run on that initial, initial cue for endless amount of time and then seamlessly transition to the next part of the music. But you need to be able to have each section kind of be isolated so it can take as much time as it needs to before you go on to the next section and then the next section. So after that you time everything out, kind of get a rough idea of how long each section needs to be. 
Um, put that in the cue sheet. Uh, make your spotting notes of kind of what you want for the music, the mood, the tone, what needs to happen. I even sometimes put, if I have specific instruments in mind, um, like for one of them I have tuned low bells, gong melody, or try the vibraphone sketch that I wrote out. So yeah, and then what's fun is the cue names after you kind of write the music. You want, you want fun names, even though nobody's really ever going to see it. So I've always liked coming up with creative funny names based on this scene. Um, I think that's part of the fun. So that's the cue sheet. Then I'll go through and build it, start building my template with the instruments I know I want to use. Instruments, sample libraries. Um, I already set up the pathways of how I know I want to mix this. You want to start with the template because it's going to keep you, kind of keep you grounded and it's also going to make it a whole lot easier to start a new cue because you're not going to be frustrated about, ah, oh, if I I have to start this new cue, but then I'm gonna to have to start from scratch. There's so much work to do in the beginning. Half your work is already done. Picking the instruments. That's one of the hardest things because there's just endless possibilities of instruments now. So if you go from the beginning and you pick exactly which ones you know you wanna use and try to stick to those, it'll help you stay organized. It'll also help you kind of create a specific sound just for this show that's different than your other projects that you've done before or, or that you're currently working on. So it'll help build a specific sound. It also limits your options because with endless options now, you could go on forever and ever trying to pick instruments and trying out different instruments and trying out different things. So template's great for that. It's great for limiting your options so you can just get right to working. So for this one, I have my solo instruments at the top and that's because I want to, I know I'm gonna be recording a lot of instruments. I'm gonna be recording the real shamisen, uh, also gonna be recording my own shakuhachi. And then I have a couple sample libraries that are also in that solo instrument category. So anything that I don't normally use or isn't part of the regular orchestral sound, uh, so specialty instruments will go up in this solo instrument category. So that's why I have my shamisen in there. I also have the Tinaguo acoustic cello legato. I have both of those in there, the regular one and her volume two. The Tinaguo one I really like because there's, it's very simple and it just works. It sounds great, it works great. I kind of prefer the raw mix. It's a little more gritty, less refined. It sounds like it's been tweaked less, which is kind of what I want because I want to be able to do my own edits, my own mixing stuff to it. So I like the raw mix. And then below that, I have the Koto library, which for those of you who don't know, it's, it's basically a Japanese harp. It's kind of on a long piece of wood and then it has um, bridges that hold up the strings and you can either have a 17 string one or a 13 string is the more traditional one. So in my template, I have two instances of that. And for actually for the Koto library, I'm using I'm using the Princess Koto uh, sample library from Premier Sound Factory. He's a Japanese recording engineer, but he also makes sample libraries. And his are all like high res sample libraries, 96 kilohertz. So they're recorded high quality, but they also are sampled and play back in 96 kilohertz. So I really like this library so far. It's got a bunch of different scales that you can go through, all the articulations. So one thing with this library, there's a lot of key switches on this one um, and they're hard to move up for some reason, my keyboard wants to trigger them from lower than they are. And I've kind of had a problem figuring out how to move them up. I know you can transpose the whole thing, but with my contact version, I don't have that option, which is unfortunate, but yeah, I'll figure that out. Uh, otherwise, the sample library sounds great. I'm thinking about getting the Tycho drums from Impact Soundworks that they just put out. That, those are exciting though. Those are the, the Isaku Kageyama Taiko drums. And this is supposedly one of the deepest sampled Taiko libraries, which can be used for more traditional Taiko drumming too, which is kind of unique because a lot of the Taiko drum sample libraries are sort of along the lines of the Hans Zimmer style where there are these big impact drums. And for this project, I don't really need that. I need the more intimate traditional style of playing. So that this library, I'm probably gonna cave, I'm gonna get it, yeah. So after I have all my solo instruments, and then the shamisen and shakuhachi at the top, those are all audio tracks. So those are not actual sample tracks, those are the spaces where I'm going to record my, um, my performances. So that's why I have two tracks each, so I can have, I can kind of stagger them, like take one, take two, take three, and then same with Shakuhachi, I have two, two tracks for recording the audio. Those are audio tracks. Cool, so after that, and then you also see the soloist sub. So that's my soloist subgroup. So all the instruments in the solo panel 
are being fed into that solo subgroup for to help make my mixing life easier. And then that solo subgroup is being fed to the stereo out in Logic. And then next group of instruments is woodwinds. So these are all sample instruments. I got flute, the swam oboe, swam English horn, swam bassoon, swam contra bassoon. And those work with the Rolly keyboard, the Rolly Seaboard Rise, the five dimensional or four dimensional. I don't know what it is. I think 5D. But the, the one where you can play the vibrato, doo, 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 stuff like that. I don't know how often I'm gonna use those, but I put them in there anyway. And then I have the woodwind subgroup for that. And then piano bell harp is actually a grouping that I learned from one of Trevor Morris's videos. <laughs> for, this, for this project, it actually works out well because I use piano a lot for my main instruments and I didn't want to rely on piano so much for this one. So that's why I put it a little bit lower. So I'm not tempted to just automatically go to the piano track and plunk something out and play something and be like, oh, it sounds great on piano. Let me leave it like that. Then out of time constraints, I will leave it like that. Then I have vibraphone live, tune gongs live. So those are two more audio tracks that I'm going to record my live vibraphone playing, my marimba one vibe. And then the tune gongs, they're not actual gongs, they're like garden gongs, but I'm planning to use that for some sound design stuff. And then I have the cretales and glock, those, so that's piano bells harp. That's kind of like your keyboard instruments, both piano and percussion. Um, so I'm separating it out that way. And then I have the PBH sub for those. Those all get mixed together. And then I have chamber strings. So this is the Spitfire library. This is the chamber strings. I have kind of two, two groups inside this one. I have the regular chamber strings violin, which is the, the standard patch that you can pick the different articulations with key switches. So I have violin one, violin two, viola, celli, bass, the normal stuff. Then I have the chamber ensemble, which I keep in there just to quickly sketch out something. If I have an idea and I want to see how the chords would sound with say, like the shamisen melody that I have recorded up at the top. Um, and then under that, I have the more specific articulations, the individual ones, if I need just the harmonics or the flotando. But for this one, I'm trying to keep it compact because the more instruments I have, the longer the mix process is gonna take. And I just need to be able to crank these out pretty fast. So I'm using the key switched versions of these. So I could play legato on the chamber string stuff and then switch to pizzicato with a keyboard switch. So that's all gonna be on one track, like violins one is just that violins one. So it kind of like how you would see it written out on a, on a paper score where they notate the articulations. That's how I'm going about this one. But then I do have the individual ones, extended techniques um, below that. A couple ones that I know I like to use, the harmonics and the flat tondo, I use those quite a bit. So I know, okay, those two I'm gonna have separately. And then Sacconi Quartet. So this is the Spitfire Sacconi Quartet um, string library. It's got a violin one, violin two, viola, cello, and then the ensemble patch. And I use it the exact same way as the chamber group one. I'm probably gonna use these a little bit more than chamber group because the theater that the show is in is kind of a washy theater. It's really reverber reverberant. So I'm worried that the chamber ensemble stuff is gonna sound too big for the theater. Also, it's kind of a small intimate show. So I wanna keep, keep it more on the smaller side of chamber groups, maybe even leaning toward just quartet and then specialized instruments. Uh, below that, we got the orchestral percussion. So this is stuff I always have just cause I'm a percussionist. So I've got a tongue drum. That's actually kind of a, a feature or specialty instrument for this one. I don't know how often I'm gonna use it. I know there's a couple scenes in there that I, I'm thinking of using it. I've also got tempo blocks and then the break drum, which are I know I need for one of the action cues. And then I have the light percussion subgroup for that stuff together. And then I have the the heavy percussion. So snare drum, bass drum, grand casa, uh, cymbals, and then timpani. So all those are kind of their own subgroup for mixing purposes. So those get different, a little bit different treatments based on based on how twinkly you want stuff or how, how big and heavy and hard hitting you want them. And then under that, I have my sound design stuff because I'm also doing sound design for this show and I have a couple patches. They have the gravity one, the vocalize, and these I might not use because I think it's gonna take you too much out of the, the setting of the show, the traditional setting, uh, but they're there just to add extra texture for some of the more stylized scenes. And then sound design audio, that's stuff that I'm gonna actually record the sound design for. So that'll play in with the, the cue, the music cue. So I have that track down there just to 
um, be able to tell, okay, is this music going to get in the way of my sound design or how are they going to complement each other? Because I want them to sound pretty seamless. I don't want it to sound too, too separated, too isolated between each other. So the sound design and the music should work together pretty well. But yeah, that's the whole template. Um, and then in the mix window, you can see at the end, I've got my short verb, short reverb, long verb, and I'm using the Seventh Heaven plugin for that. It's the the Burkasti emulation one. I haven't messed around with it too much. This is the first project I'm actually using it on. But so far I like it because I've done some shamisen tests with it and I've used that reverb to mix the shamisen with it and it sounds it sounds really great. It sounds really natural. But yeah, so that's, that's how I work. Um, so the template for this project is gonna be really important just to be my baseline. Um, my starting point for all my cues, uh, because I don't want it to take too long to set up. I just want to get to writing. The other reason I have a template is because it's a live theater show and they haven't started rehearsals yet, I want to give as much flexibility as I can. So if I need to go back and rewrite like a specific part or edit something differently, each cue is set up the same way. So the end result is going to sound the same. It's going to sound like part of the same show and not a different mix every time. Okay, very good. So that's it for today. Um, let me know what you thought of this Tutorial Tuesday. Super technical, super technical Tutorial Tuesday. I don't know if it's helpful, um, but I thought I would go over the process of how I tackle a film score that's not actually a film score. Um, Cause it's, it does require some different, different kind of mindsets, different planning. It's very manageable and um, I like this method. This one's working for me, so. Yeah, let you know how it goes. Keep it posted. See you in the next one. Bye. I gotta get, gotta get to practicing. More shamisen. Uh, yeah, back there, by the way.